as I uh, hand it over to you, just a quick introduction. Uh, Philip Marsh, a longtime partner of ours, uh, actually, I think, joined us for our CKM class about, gosh, five years ago or so now. Philip is the founder and CEO of Knowledge Mentoring Global, and he's based now in the UK, was in South Africa, now in the, in the UK. Uh, Philip, I hand it over to you, and uh, thank you so much for hosting today. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks, uh, Laurie. I just, can you, Eric, can you confirm you see my screen? Yes. Okay, I'll, let me get into it. Well, welcome, everybody, um, and, and apologies for the accent. Um, this is a, a conversation on the critical role of mobile knowledge mentoring in, in post-COVID recovery. And I've just entitled, I've titled it the, the ugly, the bad, and the good of our new reality. So, so let's kind of get into where we're going. Just a quick intro of who I am, just to position, if, if, if there are any psychologists or social workers in the group, I just want to position who I am, um, is I'm not a social worker or a psychologist, but I'm dealing with a topic that is very close to that. Um, I'm in fact a chartered civil and structural engineer, and uh, I spent 18 years in major engineering projects like that power station you see there. Um, but for the last 23 years, I've been the founder of a knowledge mentoring consultancy, which is we, we, we're now uh, globalizing from the UK. Um, and the, the slides are made up of a balance of experience and practitioner research. So if there are any academics or um, sort of uh, formal ac uh, researchers in the program, they may be annoyed by the way I've uh, approached this, but I, I, I talk it as it through as a practitioner. And, and just to position it is that this is now my, my life's purpose and, and passion. So that group at the bottom there, um, is a group that we work with closely in Southern Africa. A uh, fantastic group with the Study Trust Group. I think maybe Dr. Murray Hoffman might even be on the, on the, the conversation. So we're very proud of our work we do. And that's what it's all about. It's about mobile knowledge mentoring. So the agenda I'm going to cover, I have to cover. I have a tendency to talk fast and I will try and keep that under control. Um, but I, I'm going to be citing things from various different organizations and primarily coming from the UK government, um, Innovate UK, JP Morgan Chase, the work that they, obviously the World Economic Forum. And then very importantly, I'm going to be citing and referencing the work that uh, Nesta does in the UK um, in conjunction with JP Morgan and some of the fantastic uh, career mapping causeways that they are doing as a result of the both automation and COVID recovery. So I'm gonna deal with quickly the current reality I'm going to then talk a little bit about future shock readiness. And between those two, I'll have a short pause for one or two questions, one or two quick questions. Any, any longer questions, if we could delay those to the end. We'll talk about future shock readiness. I'm going to then introduce um, some of our experiences, mainly from the UK, uh, stakeholder collaborative effort environment looks like. And, and there will be obviously be similar things happening all around the world in the, in the major countries. And then I'm going to introduce the, uh, the solutions that collaboratives can have and, and, and smaller collectives of people, not necessarily major stakeholders, but smaller collective groups and smaller communities or companies operating with communities. And what are some of the solutions that we could look at over there? And then I'm going to put together about eight ideas and solutions or things that we've tried and worked we know they work. They, um, some of them will, I'll, I'll cite research um, to back up the, the experience that we've had and others have had and hopefully plant some seeds and ideas with yourselves for things that you can think about doing to, to cater for this, this huge disruptive uh, pandemic as well as the, the, the sort of autonomy and, and the future world of work. And then I'm going to end off by an introduction to the power and role of of remote, remote uh, mobile mentoring, um, using technology to do this kind of thing. So to start, I think we all can accept that we were very much an ill-prepared world. This virus has been talked about for years. Um, 30 years ago, uh, biologist Beekman was talking about this. We wouldn't be wiped out by another great extinction you know, from, from, from space or um, a super volcano, it's going to come in the small things. And it's been talked about for many years. I think Bill Gates even uh, prophesied it in 2015. So we weren't prepared for this as we should have been. I think we were stuck in the it won't happen to us syndrome. And I think a lot of us live in countries where 
massive lessons were being lost on a daily, weekly basis, all in the name of politics and personal power. And, and that's a tragedy because in this knowledge age, we should, have, we should have really got it right. And then it begs a question, which may be um, a little bit controversial, but has COVID and ha have pandemics possibly just accelerated an eventuality of the fourth industrial revolution, the fifth industrial revolution, and the new world of work, which was going towards autonomy anyway. I'm not going to read all these statistics, but this was um, published by IGI International. It's, it's uh, entitled The Pandemic's Permanent Impact on Unemployment and the International Economy. And the statistics are frightening. And these statistics, although it was published in October, these statistics are from April 2020. And they are, they are mind numbing. And these are probably almost uh, doubled in many of the areas, not necessarily all of them, but in many areas they would have doubled, uh, certainly in countries like the UK, which the COVID, we are, we are back in lockdown. Um, there's talk in many other countries of going back into much stringer lockdown. So besides the ill-prepared world, I want to talk very quickly about the ages of modern man, and then we'll take a quick pause and get questions if there are any. The, the ages of modern man, as you know, sort of started initially with the agricultural age, um, whenever that started, but round about, 8,000 years BC, and, and, and man and systems and development has evolved since then, and, and, and we've grown, and then the sort of the mid-1700s, uh, steam engines and printing presses and other clever things were developed, and was the beginnings of the first industrial age, and, and there are arguably a few industrial ages with flight coming into it, etc., along the way, but what really was the next paradigm step change was the information age, um, probably around the 1950s when the first major mainframe computers were, were coming out and accelerating very, very rapidly. And, and that's grown and it's continued to grow as we know in the last 10 years of our, our lives, how technology has just grown exponentially you know, at, at, a, at a pace that's almost uncontrollable. And there's an interesting new age now, which is not clearly defined, but we're definitely in the beginning of it, which is this age of imagination or the imagination age, probably sort of 2000 onwards, 2010 onwards. But if you look at people like the Elon Musks and, and, and people like that of the world that are just breaking all our, our traditional ways of thinking about things. I mean, his the space flight and cars and just incredible advances all at the pace of in sometimes single human imaginations. So this is an incredibly disruptive force, possibly for good, but also possibly very challenging for humankind, who's, who's going to be much slower to respond to these things. So we need, to be, we need to be very cognizant that what I'm talking about here is not purely COVID related. It actually is part of a much greater eventual reality anyway. The fourth industrial revolution has been talked about for, for some time. The new world of work, the, the future of work, the, the, the jobs of tomorrow, all of these kinds of things all converge and lead to one thing, is that the destruction of jobs as we know them right now is going to accelerate before the recreation of new jobs are available. Those, those new works and those new roles have not emerged yet. So there is going to be massive job destruction globally and, and what do we do with that? And that's both a combination pandemic induced as well as the new world of work. And, and guesstimates coming out of uh, various sources that I've already cited, look at emergent roles past 2025 being approximately 50 million new roles in different job types, in different scenarios, in different sectors will emerge. Many of them have not been mapped yet. They're not even clearly understood. I'll talk shortly about what, uh, what Nestor are doing with JP Morgan and others in terms of trying to map some of those. And, and what's going to happen, which is the, really the first time since the, the late information age and the beginning of the imagination age, is there's going to be a completely new division of labor. It's traditionally been all human based. And then with the industrial revolution, increasingly with machines. So 
everything that we, we have done for many years has been combinations of humans and machines. And now we're going to be splitting that with algorithms. And I'm going to talk just now about the impact of algorithms on our human development and in this age of imagination, and how fast those algorithms will develop and how fast they will replace everything that we are used to. So global change, and this is no longer local change, this is global change and it's massive disruption at the speed of thought. As people, as entrepreneurs, as innovators, as, as visionaries come up with new ways of doing things, things will change globally in an instant. And uh, a webinar I was on last week was talking about the, the feeding frenzy in Silicon Valley at the moment and in other um, innovation hubs and investment hubs in the world around technology driving massive disruptive innovation or this what you know what's this exactive innovation at a speed that is that the world has never seen before and in the current reality i just also want to have a quick talk about the pace of technology we've all we're familiar with virtual reality we're familiar with augmented reality we've we've all become familiar with the concept of autonomous vehicles and autonomous drones and um, all of these things. And, and what's happened in the knowledge realm is that the world is now disintermediated. You, don't, you no longer have to go through experts and, and, and people and layers of trainers and consultants. You, you, you go straight, but you connect the source and the seeker. There's no longer the need for intermediaries in these things if you are connected into the right groups with the right technologies. That makes things cheaper, faster, better. Things are dematerialized completely. You no longer need buildings. You no longer need training rooms and materials and projectors and, and these sort of things. You can do it with a smartphone and you can connect with an entire world from, from, from a beach. Um, the, the, the costs of material goods and the costs of infrastructure have, have, will, will disappear, which, which places a whole new world of challenge in terms of jobs and things. monetized. You, don't, you no longer have to pay to go through academic institutions, learning institutions, libraries, the, the providers of books and bookstores and things. Um, it's completely demonetized. If you are connected in the right circles, the knowledge is free and you just have to ask for it. So I've put up a little prompter there for myself. Pause. Um, Eric and Brandon, are there any questions that we should deal with at this stage? Would anybody like to put a question forward? Or should I continue? Checking Eric? out for you, Philip. Uh, let's see. We do have a quick question here uh, from Steve uh, Nicholas. If you want to check the chat box. If you don't get to it, I can actually read it for you. Yeah, if you could do, sorry, I'm just not getting it here quickly. I've got a... Sure. Is it uh, premature to define major ages just because we have better visibility of granularity of the recent past? Soon we will have an age every decade, exclamation point. Uh, the comedy Norseman set in the Viking era saw to wonder at homing pigeons, uh, i.e. at a distance uh, communication uh, as a technology that no one really knows how it works. I'm not sure if you get the gist of that, but uh, that was the question. Yeah, I think it's, it's, a, it is, it's almost a philosophical question. So, so I, I think um, I'm not the, the owner of the, um, the categorization of the ages. I'm taking, I'm taking a, a stab at what is generally accepted as the ages. And, and from a philosophical point of view, if those are incorrect, then I mean, I, that's, that's, a, that's an open debate. I think, I think certainly what is for sure is that ages and epochs in terms of human technological development and capacity development and what we will be able to do in terms of space travel and working at you know, quantum physics and the inner workings of the, of the brain, et cetera, those are going to accelerate way beyond any traditional step changes in the ages. So, so I think, you know, I agree. Um, I think it, it, it may be premature, and, it, but it's been around for a long time. So I hope that sort of kind of offers some, 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 uh, some answer to that. We can, we can continue that afterwards. So thank you for that question. I'm going to continue if you don't mind. Okay, the, 
the question I, or the, the topic I want to discuss now is uh, around future shock readiness. Um, and it's, it's really trying to balance collaboration with caring. Uh, traditionally, businesses have been moving for the last 15, 20 years towards increased collaboration, but not necessarily towards increased caring. If we look at kind of emergent capability driven needs, most of the universities and most of the educational systems and learning institutions are not prepared for the new worlds of work. Only, only some of them are trying to map those capabilities. Certainly places like um, Nesta and, and others are doing massive work in, in Europe with the European skills and competencies and occupations frameworks, trying to merge them with, with the known and the unknown. I'll talk about that just now. But that's the same as happening in the, in the US with the MIT and JP Morgan collaborations and, and others. So this is, a, this is something we need to keep our eyes and ears open for because emergent capability driven needs are, are not mapped. They're not clearly defined. These will, these will, uh, these will morph as, as needs drive. And this sort of exaptive repurposing and reskilling, which is, which is not general repurposing and reskilling. This is at a, a completely at a revolutionary scale um, or evolutionary scale. It is, it is fundamentally a step change. And, and that's what's going to challenge the traditional time it takes to write learning curriculum and learning courses and things like that. And, and so it's going to increasingly rely heavily on on the job learning and training. While it almost sort of trench warfare is that you, you can't go to a military college and, and learn the battle plan until you're actually in the trenches. And it's going to be that kind of analogy that's, that's probably going to be, be quite relevant. So what is becoming increasingly important in all the work that we do and all the research I do and everything that I read and participate in is besides looking at the, the hard competencies and, and the management of new capabilities and skills and behaviors and coping mechanisms, is there's going to be an equal or the necessity for an equal focus on community and affiliation and building the sense of belonging to something. The, the remote working is having a deleterious effect on the minds and the psyche of many and many of our workers. So mental health is going to become an issue. Psychosocial support at massive scale is going to become absolutely critical. The work I do with Dr. Murray Hoffmeyer in South Africa, in, in the university environment, um, where we, we, we connect uh, business leaders with first year university students who come from um, less privileged backgrounds. And we find that a, 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 crit a critical need is psychosocial support. It's similar to the conversations we're having in the UK. Um, this is not something that is the domain of, of, of disadvantaged or poorer people. This is, the, this is a, a human, thing where people are, are alienated. And um, I've just mapped a few of the competencies that are coming out of all the research. And if you've got different research to this, then I, I, I think that's great. But there are large amounts of commonality in what I have mapped over here. So without getting into the, the hard competencies and, and just looking at obvious things, but it, almost everybody going forward, certainly by 2025, will have to have some kind of foundational digital skills. That, that will be absolutely paramount. Um, a lot of people with smartphones have got used to using apps and banking software and that sort of kind of thing, but that's going to increase to a new level of survival from the point of view of acquiring skills and knowledge and training and relationships and, and networking. And then what's also going to have to happen, which has not necessarily been our history is that everyone is going to have some sort of ability for basic data interpretation. It's going to be absolutely critical. Uh, if we're not able to do that, we will not be able to do the jobs of the future. And then there's a, there's a, 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 you know, a plethora of soft skills that are going to be needed. And I won't read all of those, but um, they are all focused on sort of pervasive uncertainty. The, Things like sense making, you know, the, the work of uh, Professor David Snowden over the years um, and, and, and colleagues like, like Veek and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Granovetter in terms of the strength of weak tires and things like that. It's all 
to do with making sense of a more chaotic. So we'll talk about chaos theory and, and sense making a little bit more just now. But it's about active learning. It's about stress tolerance. These are not competencies that have been traditionally taught in the corporate world or through universities or are well taught even now with the, 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 the many, many learning institutions and training centers. These are going to have to be become mainline curriculum and everyone's going to have to be able to get better and better. So self-management, leading without authority, with you know, the, the remote working space, these will become absolute critical base competencies for the new world of work and in order to be able to survive. So what, he, what we have is because we're going to be going away from traditional classroom and traditional learning and, and well-structured academic constructs for learning and curriculum development, the potential for hermeneutical discord and cognizant, cognitive dissonance is going to become huge. The, the, the disjoint between different cultural perceptions of how we learn and making sense of other cultural learning models and systems and techniques and, and, and the different languages used, uh, the different terminology, the different vernacular, um, this is going to potentially cause bigger dissonance and discord. And we, we have to be very cognizant, uh, cognizant of that. It's, it's, uh, the more remote we go, the more we are going to be stuck in our own paradigm, in our own, own view of the world and, and reliant on our own journeys and paths. And, and we need to work out how we, we, we dissipate that possible disconnection between the message and the messenger. And that's going to require work. Um, and, and, and I say that because the research from the World Economic Forum and, and others shows that by 2025, 45% of all major employers are saying that they will have created safe and productive working practices remotely for their, for their employees. That's a massive shift. Uh, I certainly wouldn't want to be a property developer or a, a, an office block owner right now. The, the shift to remote working practices is, is going to completely fundamentally change the human psyche in the way we collaborate with others, in the way we feel about ourselves, in our sense of affiliation and connection. We have to be very, very cognizant of that. And I put it here, um, not as based on the basis of research, but on the basis of my own intuitive reasoning, having spent a lifetime in this space is that I think well-being of people, um, and that's communities, that's not just your staff. I think the well-being of your staff, but also the communities that you serve and the communities that, that your organizations live in will become a strategic critical differentiator. I think that is going to, that's really going to become um, something that, that, that the social enterprise, the rise of the social enterprise is going to become a strategic differentiator. I have absolutely no doubt about that. And we'll talk more about what we can do to try and address that um, as, we, as we continue to try and survive these, these exaptive changes. So from a future shocking point of view, if we, if we look at what we have to be ready for, we, we, the research is telling us already that there's a, there's a, there's a jump by a factor of four of individuals using their own money, their, hard, their own hard earned salaries to invest in their own self-learning. So if they're not getting what they want from their companies who may not have what they want, and they're not able to find what they want through the courses that are offered through their own learning systems, they will invest in their own through you know, things like Udemy and Coursera and the Khan Academy and things like that. And, and the many, many fantastic free online learning or very cheap discounted online learning courses and a, a huge jump in individuals investing in themselves and that's going to continue and there's a jump of a factor of five of employers increasingly enabling their employees and and doing really strange things that they would never have done six months ago we, we know an organization in, in, in southern africa that did a survey with its staff and the single most important thing that the staff wanted were, were chairs, decent chairs to sit at at home, bearing in mind that many of these employees don't live in luxury apartments and luxury homes. And besides having a laptop and a smartphone and data, 
and a good Wi-Fi connection, which obviously companies sort out as a, as a given, the, the single thing, so they went out and bought 700 chairs, comfortable executive leather sort of chairs. And these are the things that, are, that employers are doing to enable the employees to be happy and productive and continue, continue to work from home. So the, the challenge we have here, and certainly our experience in this space, um, and, we, and we are really immersed in this space, is that more experienced staff, slightly older staff, will be able to migrate virtually much more easily than the younger, less, less experienced staff. They, are, they have connections, they have experiences, they have pattern recognition for, from years of doing things right and wrong and knowing the difference between right and wrong on, on various levels. But the less experienced staff, the young graduates, the new interns, the apprentices, the new staff, the uh, the 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 students who are coming for sort of VAC work into, their organi into organizations that sponsor them. There's only one thing that's going to get them through is access to some form of mentoring because they, they don't have the intuitive reasoning to be able to connect the dots that the older, more experienced people have. They've been around, they've burnt their fingers, they've got relationships, they can pick up a phone. Less experienced people don't have that and they tend to aggregate with each other and it's, it's, it's what, what, what happens then is that you have the perpetuation of poor practice because the, it's the blind leading the blind unintentionally. So, so that is, and I, I, you know, everything that I'm doing in my, as I said, my life's purpose now is based on the importance of organizations and communities taking mentoring and, and knowledge mentoring specifically, not just um, traditional mentoring, but knowledge mentoring specifically, what are the, the, the knowledge requirements, the skills, the knowledge, the behaviors, the experience, the relationships, the networks of the future that inexperienced people will need so that they can gradually claw their way to becoming an experienced person and then helping the others and passing the, passing the gift of knowledge exchange on. So the, the vulnerable and at risk um, are going to require massive collaborative effort. This is not something that any one organization or any one government is going to be able to do by itself. The, the, the vulnerable are, are both ends of the spectrum. You know, the, 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 the less skilled individuals, the young between possibly 16 to 24 who are getting into the work environment for the first time, they may have a less than perfect um, educational journey that they've been on, um, they're going to be taking up the lower sort of level jobs and positions that are normally available and the low paid jobs. Um, and, and, and obviously that's a huge worry, but then there's the at risk. There's, there's, you know, disabled people, much older people, the people with comorbidities um, that are at work and are able to survive very well at work with medication and, and good care, et cetera. And, and now they're at risk because of pandemics and because of the, the change in the way work takes place and this is going to require collaborative effort and i'm going to talk about what i think are some of the ideas and, and, and opportunities for collaborative effort and then i'm going to just quickly mention that you know this is this cannot be done by any any country without long-term government support absolutely critical looking at a, a couple of statistics from the research here is that 40 percent of the workforce by 2025 is going to need intervention based reskilling not simple reskilling this is because of the complexity of the new emergent competency sets and the new skills required and and then an, an amazing statistic is is we're finding that 97% of the business leaders that were interviewed say that future proofing and future job based reskilling will have to take place on the job they don't have the budgets, they don't have the time, and they are not the appropriate trainers to be able to reskill them and upskill them and repurpose them in, uh, in a training or work, work uh, sort of a trip, traditional working uh, learning environment. It's going to have to be done on the job. So this, this you know, the, the, the need here for mentoring by the experience, learning the kind of adaptive uh, competencies and techniques is going to be absolutely critical. And, and so the, the what 
is that current inequalities in the world are likely to get worse and not better. And, and that is because the inequalities where very often the less experienced, inexperienced people or people coming from different backgrounds into the formal working sector, probably coming, you know, migrating out of the informal sector into the formal sector, will have what we've already talked about, the, 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 the potential for the sort of hermeneutic discord and, and the, the cognitive dissonance where the way they've learned and the way they've trained and the way they've developed from a cultural perspective may be very different to the sophisticated working environment that they find themselves in. And this will need to evolve over time and it, and it requires non-traditional ways of mentoring and of training and of assisting. And, and, and we believe that learner to learner is going to be absolutely critical in this space. This is no longer top down expert led instructor led kind of learning and skills development. Learner to learner, peer to peer is going to be absolutely a critical success factor. And so I think that the, the rise of the truly social enterprise is going to be, you know, a, a no longer a good thing to say and no longer a thing to have on your corporate social investment and your annual financial statements to publish. I think it's going to be a differentiator to be a social enterprise organization and recognized for that. And I, I think, as with other things in terms of environmental scorecards and quality scorecards, I think the social enterprise will eventually have some kind of scorecard that is attached to the SDGs and, and, and other things that need to take place from country to country. And, and I think this will lead eventually to this epistemic justice, which is the, the ability for everybody to access knowledge. And, and, it's, and knowledge is no longer the, the, um, the preserve of the, of the privileged and the fortunate and the educated and the well-heeled. The, the, the social enterprise will, will provide epistemic justice. It will provide access to this free tsunami of knowledge that's actually available to us as humanity if we just were prepared to share with each other. And so mobile knowledge mentoring in this space gives us the cheapest form of technology that is the most ubiquitous form of technology to share with others. And I think when we start that, we can, we can, we can reform great ills in our society, but also we can future-proof ourselves and prepare for future shocks because we can connect big organizations and, and uh, volunteering communities with others that need the knowledge. And, and I, I put it to you that all of this requires an effort that is so big, it is completely unsustainable from a financial perspective without collaborative effort. So I come back to that and, you know, what is the discussion on collaborative effort? Um, the, an idea in, uh, which really got the development of our technolo technology uh, journey was a paper that I wrote and delivered in India in 2015. Um, and it was based on, the paper was called Knowledge Swarms and Experiential Hives, and it actually went on to become a book chapter. I'll give you a reference on that. But it really looked at in developed societies and in developing societies is why we are not working as collaboratives um, and why we don't have collaborative effort between government, between academia, between established organizations and between emergent organizations. And so Knowledge Swarms and Experiential Hives was essentially about what was the, the, the most elegant, cost-effective, ubiquitous way of connecting the sources of knowledge and wisdom, of knowledge and wisdom and experience. And, and it looked at, in that paper and in the subsequent chapter, it looked at uh, anywhere where there are major infrastructural projects or cross-sectoral projects or even mega projects. And, and this obviously is something, if you look at um, the agenda 2063 in Africa, where there are so many major projects happening in different countries where there is zero cross sharing, not just um, across projects, but across countries. And, um, and this should, should not be the, the case. I'm, I'm talking to some people about assisting in the power sector in Africa in three countries, sorry, nine countries. Um, and it makes sense because these are common knowledge needs based on mega projects. Power stations aren't small projects that happen over a three month duration. They take many years, major dams, major railways, major tunnels, 
major harbors are all projects that are being built in Africa as we speak over and over and over. And there is almost zero knowledge transfer or mentoring that's going on and knowledge sharing for the betterment of the entire continent. And that's, that's the same in India and it's the same in many other developed societies. And, and that's where when I, developed, when I presented this paper in India, we had a lot of interest from the developing countries, but also developed societies where, who are also not necessarily getting it right. And so I use the bee analogy and the wisdom of the hive as the basis of the model. And it really, what it did is it, it introduced this, this, the concept of the quorum sensor, which is when, when bees know in swarms or other, other swarms change direction or change mood. And there's no email or memo given to the other bees. Um, it just happens. There's this thing called the quorum sensor and the swarm changes and it morphs and it de-swarms and it re-swarms. And it's, and it's all on sort of common purpose in this, this quorum sensor. And, and I believe that nations of the future, countries that really want to come up with elegant solutions to these, these very disruptive forces that are around, the sort of you know, autonomous uh, or automation, sorry, of, of the future world of work and, and, and coping with pandemics, not just this current one, but the other ones to come, which for sure are going to come, is, is going to need something way beyond what we normally look. So I, I, I put these little characters together in this paper and the hivers were essentially the older retired or retiring subject matter experts and people with vast amounts of knowledge and experience and, and, and how could they connect to the, the swarmers essentially who were coming in out of school, out of university, out of the technical colleges and things like that with no experience and lots of enthusiasm and going to change the world. And, and how do we create an intermediary? And the intermediary between the hiver and the swarmer was the swiver. And that isn't a word that exists in it. It exists in, in the set of characters I created in, in, in these books and chapters and things that I wrote. And the swiver is your, is your overworked, underpaid, stressed out, middle order manager, who's also a mentor and trying to make both ends meet, burning seven candles at all ends, and is also at the same time trying to do the best for their staff and the employees and, 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 and create this knowledge cascade. And the end game in this model was the thriver. And the thriver is, is the beneficiary who goes through this, this common knowledge hive and has the benefit of access to the hivers when they need the knowledge and the hivers are always there and they replace themselves as they do sort of the royal jelly of the of the of the hive which is the kind of analogy and the swivers come and go but it goes back to the common knowledge hive which is the where the documentation with the context with the conversations with the the situational relevance is discussed and it can be reviewed and and the, and, and the swarmers come in but Essentially, what we want is we want them to come out of the hive, not necessarily as employees, but also those with the propensity to become self-employed. And that's what the future, I believe, holds for many, many of our school leavers and our young graduates, is to get away from the baby boomer and the ex-gen mindset of you're going to have a job and you must go and study at university and study tech and study all of these things to get a job and get into the system and, and climb the corporate ladder over 30 to 35 years. And we have to break that mindset and we have to build thrivers who are work ready and who are entrepreneurial ready and are looking at self-employment as a means of creating their own sustainability and ultimately employment and job creation. Because if they're successful, they will employ someone to work with them. And, and that's a model I think is, is going to be the survival model, certainly for Africa, and other societies where the population growth is, is outstripping all forms of, of, of financial support and systems that are broken and infrastructure that's broken. And it's going to be incumbent upon those countries that they develop the mindset of, of not this entitlement of a job and entitlement of a position somewhere, but you're going to have to look after yourself and create a living for yourself and, 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 and be completely you know, interdependent into, from the system, but, but have access to the system. And, and that's, the, that's the new model, I believe. It's not total independence. It's an interdependency 
into a common knowledge hive and into some sort of collaborative environment. So there's a chapter there um, that I wrote for IGI International. If anybody wants to reference, I, I write a lot more on that whole model there. And, and then the, the collaborative effort over here, I think really is exemplified by, and this is just very localized from, from here in the UK. Um, UK, and I think anybody in the UK knows about Innovate UK and the, the massive work, the, the Sustainable Innovation Fund, it was round one, there was round two, there's round three. I mean, there's about 55 billion pounds that have been put out to, to support organizations and infrastructure and everything purely around this temporary framework for, for COVID recovery. And every country, every major sophisticated country in the world is doing these, these kinds of collaborative efforts. And, and then the work that I'm, I'm really impressed by is the Nesta challenges and the work they do in collaboration with JP Morgan. And I'm gonna talk a bit more about that. There's this wonderful publication that's just been put out. I'll reference it in the next slide. But I would urge you, if you are in this space, of looking at what to do with your younger generation or you're involved in community upliftment and the jobs are few and the jobs are going to be become fewer, then, then this is really something you should have a look at. Um, I don't own the copyright for this particular slide. This is the, the owned by the, the, the authors of this magazine and all this publication and, and Nested Challenges and JP Morgan, but they've given me permission to use it. And, and you'll see the, the authors at the bottom of the left-hand screen so I'd, I'd urge you to go and have a look at that if, if you'd like to. But essentially, the, the publication analyzed 16,000 jobs, sorry, 1,600 jobs. And they measured three things. They measured the, the risk of the jobs that would be taken out by automation. So, so what, were the, what was the automation risk for 1,600 jobs? And, and then they looked at who were the workers that were most at risk in automation coming into these jobs. And, and each of those jobs and roles, you know, had various different worker levels in it. And so they identified who would be the most at risk. And then what they did is using um, artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms is they, they mapped alternative job and transition learning pathways. And so what, what, what they call the, um, the Mapping Career Causeways is a fantastic publication. And they, they generally measured the whole, you know, the automation uh, risk, and then they measured what you would do. And, and so if you are a, a doorman in, a, in, a, in, a, in an organization, in a, in a hospitality industry, and there are, will be no doorman in the future, what can you do that using your doorman skills plus some other skills that go with that? So, there's, there's other work that's done over here, obviously, um, as I've mentioned already, JP Morgan, MIT doing massive stuff in the, U, the US about that, and every country in the world uh, will be doing that. So if you come from the APAC region, I apologize about not addressing you or Africa, but there's really good stuff. So I just want to go back there. Um, Eric, I, I think I've spoken quite a lot there, and I see we're down to about 35 minutes, so I just want to quickly pause. Are there any major questions there that I need to deal with? Uh, well, I'm not sure about major, but we do have a couple of new questions. And so if you, if you don't have the chat box in front of you, I can go ahead and uh, recite those for you here. Uh, let's see, we have uh, from David. Also, real quick, uh, Philip, um, do you, you have the presentation. I wanna, I wanna upload it to the chat. Some people are asking for the presentation, if you have it. Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, let's see, question from David Watkins. Is there a competitive element between energy companies that may thwart the collaboration effort? Sorry, Brennan, say that again. It was a... Uh, let's see, from David Watkins. Uh, is there a competitive element between energy companies that may thwart the collaboration effort? Um, okay, so I think that, um, David, I think the, the name was, thank you, David, for the question. Um, the, 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 so the work we're doing with an organization called PIESA, the Power Institute for Eastern and Southern Africa, it's essentially the, the, the power generation utilities, the major utilities. So they're not competitive entities such as, you know, Siemens or an ABB or an Altron or that sort of kind of thing. They're actually the, the institutions that are uh, responsible for power generation in the country. There, there would no doubt be competitive things, but we are not looking 
at the at the things that are the, that sort of ten percent that creates competitive uh, commercial advantage. We're mainly looking at things in in there in, in in this particular instance. We're looking at things like uh, power theft and and uh, and 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 losses, etc. We're looking at things where where young electrician young young electrical engineers travel to distant areas of their countries, and we're talking about all the countries in southern Africa. And um, after you know six months or a year out of being out of university as a qualified electrical engineer, they get electrocuted because they have been sent to do the job of an electrician, and and under the auspices of a mentor and using modern technologies, these things would be eradicated completely. And we, we also find in the electrical sector there there's uh, and, and and as well as the construction sector in southern Africa, massive repetitive predictable errors and huge losses which should be should be avoided and these are this is you know the old Pareto analysis the 80 20 principle 80 percent of the problems that are happening are common knowledge there, there's no competitive advantage it's actually in the interests of 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 the countries the communities the companies to eradicate this this un you know this unprecedented wastage based on on sort of inexperience and, and lack of access to context as they need it um, on some areas but we're not talking to them about sharing highly competitive stuff i hope that answers the question david thank you for the question eric um brandon i'm going to continue i'm i'm, I, I'm we can come we can circle back if i get through the the rest of the questions so what I want to look at quickly now is some, some ideas. Um, the holocratic model, uh, these are for collectives, ideas that you know, communities and collectives can try. This is a model I wrote about in, in, in my paper. It's called the, the 5C holocratic model. It's essentially a nation building solution. And the idea was that it all starts with me as a colleague. You know, what, what do I know? What do I need? What can I share? And build that mindset in every employee and every person that is out there and and ideally what we want is we want to connect these people to the the unemployed colleagues as well so so work we're proposing here in the uk and elsewhere is is that we should be able to connect employed young graduates with unemployed graduates because the unemployed graduates cannot move towards any form of work readiness because they continuously disassociate it from the conversations of context, which are so critical for them getting a job. So work readiness becomes, you know, it becomes completely exacerbated. So it's about building a mindset. Every day I come to work, every day I wake up, I should, I should ask myself three questions. What do I know? What do I need? What can I share? And if we do that and we get those, you know, we get colleagues and we get people and learner to learner collaborations going, We'll, we'll just get better companies working. And, and, and so we, everywhere we work, we try to get this. We try to build this as a pervasive uh, competency and a mindset. It's actually a way of doing work. And, and, and as we do, as companies get more involved in their communities, the communities will uplift and then communities will start to share as well. And there's massive knowledge trapped in our communities. And, and they are very often the, the, um, the beneficiaries or the clients of our goods and services and give them what we think is what they need and we're not very good and so the, the whole thing around sort of design thinking is completely missed when we look at um, the, the value chain of what we as industry produce and what we even as academics produce is we're not always listening to what our the recipients and the users and we think we understand the customer but we still don't understand the user and so this is increasingly about how we build this holocratic model. So we have this, this value chain. And obviously, if we get communities right, we build a great country. And if we get countries right, we can, we can start working towards building a continent. And, and that, I think, is what Agenda 2063 in Africa is looking to do. And it's certainly the work I'm hoping to do with uh, PIESA and other organizations. Talking last year to the RAN, um, I'm, a, I'm a chartered civil and structural engineer, and talking to the RAN last year in the UK, we're hoping to do some work there where we can connect uh, retired UK water and sanitation engineers with the uh, new graduates in Africa, where water and sanitation is a massive problem. And, and, and these things are all completely doable because the knowledge is available. 
And the technology now is very cheap or, and all freely available and, and quick to get sort of sponsored by the networks and things like that. And, you know, access to, to data and zero rated bundles and all that kind of thing. So there's, there's, there's no reason that we can't do this. We just need willing participants. So this model here really suggests a model to try and equalize the traditional chase for cash flow and equalize it with a focus on caring. And so if we can get, you know, this, this caring communities and caring companies, I think that's a force for change. And, and the other one is to understand the, the, the kind of Dunning-Kruger effect. The, you know, we come out of school and university, all of us, um, and we are very confident and we've got a smartphone and we think we are going to change the world. And we certainly set our sights on that. And we, 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 in the space of unconscious incompetence, we, we don't know what we don't know. And it takes a few expensive lessons or an angry boss or, or a, a bit of pain and hurt for us to realize that we actually don't know what we don't know. And then we start to job hop and we roll down this, 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 this valley into this valley of despair. And it's only when we start to listen and learn and interpret and reason and realize that we don't know everything, or we get access to a mentor, or we get access to sort of a collaborative group. And what I'm putting forward here is that this is what we call the collaborative effort. You know, it's a combination of multiple stakeholders working together way beyond all our known traditional corporate training and support and government support and the discord between government and corporations. And, and, it's, and it's about how we as individuals take some control of our own future. So it's, it's how we create these collectors of, uh, and access to experiential wisdom. And, and, and all of the, the lessons that have been learned and all the stories that have been told need to be available and they need to be in a place that they are easily accessible. Things like situational relevance, where we, we come out and we think we've got a degree, and I'm very well qualified, and I have been through this, this expensive learning path at the expense of my employers at the time. And we think we have the toolkits, and we think we have access, and we think we have Google, and we have access to the world of knowledge. And in fact, all we have is access to the world of unstructured data and information. And so situational relevance and the understanding of situational relevance is absolutely critical, and which is why all young graduates who want to become professionals cannot register as a professional three days after they graduate. It takes them three to five years to become a registered professional engineer, accountant, lawyer. And the reason for that is they, they don't have the context, they don't have the experiential wisdom, they don't have the situational relevancy. And they can only get that through this collaborative effort and you know, knowledge sharing. So the need for speed and context on demand is, is upon us at a level that is, that is unprecedented in human history because we're no longer working in our clans and in our tribes and in our small uh, villages and, and we are remote from everything else. We are now working and we are connected across the globe as we are in this webinar. And so very often we need an answer and we need it now. We need it in the moment of learning. We don't need to look it up. We don't need to go and search it and then get confused by 72 trillion downloads. We, we want a quick answer. We need to connect three dots in a 500 dot puzzle because the remaining three dots sort out the chaos and they make sense for us. And then we'll use our own brain to work out the rest of the reasoning. So it's about uh, common needs and understanding these common needs. And if we can get this right, we can get really involved in collective uplift. And, and that will deal with pandemic related future shocks and it will deal with the, this, this whole, or, you know, uh, autonomy that's uh, not autonomy, uh, um, automization that's going to take place. So what I'm suggesting is understanding this effect and creating solutions for it will create accelerated capability and, and capacity. If you, if you in the, the learning and development space at all, you'll understand the modern learner and, and Josh Burson uh, and his work. Um, I see we're running short of time there. I've taken a bit longer than I'm, so I'm going to rush through this. Um, he talks about them being overwhelmed, distracted, impatient. So automation and pandemic effects have created uncertainty. Um, it's about own, no longer ownership of content. It's about access to context. And, and communication is, you know, technology can make 
communication happen. Only engaged people can make collaboration and learning happen. So it's, it's creating that contextual clarity. I'm going to rush through this because this is a bit involved. This is the work of Snowden and Veek and others around the Kinefin model and, and looking at sense making. Because there's some, there's some other stuff that I want to get to um, more importantly before I run out of time. This, this is really good stuff and it's, it's covered well in the Kinefin model by David Snowden. It's about creating resilience to change and understanding chaos. But this is important here. It's about the uh, creating mentors and, and cascades of mentoring. It's our, what we call the mentors to multipliers model. So it's connecting the vital few to the critical many. It's creating a cascade of mentoring. It's creating the wisdom in that collaborative or what uh, 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 James Surovicki calls the, the wisdom of crowds. About, it's about creating enhanced employability and work readiness. That's really, uh, really critical. It's a self-loading mechanism. So as they leave, new people can join. And this is around building experiential capability realization. It's about you know, combining skills and abilities with knowledge and know-how, behaviors and attitude, experiences and lessons, relationships and networks. And it's creating a self-sustaining interdependent society where knowledge exchange happens between communities and, and companies and, and individual colleagues. And it's, it, it self-sustains and it builds critical thinking and knowledge networks. And so it's about balancing the learning journey and understanding that we need to set goals, where we are now, where we would like to be. It's about goal mentoring and an action plan for how we want to get there. And then building a practical journey made up of actions and an emotional journey made up of the way we feel about things. And so the, the num number one epigenetic factor around um, affecting mental health and longevity. And if you read any of the work by Joe Dispenza and Anthony Robin and Stephen Covey, et cetera, it really covers this in very much detail. So connecting purpose with planning and passion is absolutely critical to, all, to our countries and our economies and our companies. And then the old ubiqu ubiquitous iceberg model is, you know, the one eighth of the iceberg is what we see. It's the results and the behaviors above the water. But actually what's happening underneath is our beliefs. And, and, and can we adjust the way we think about things? And if, we, if mentoring can assist us think better, and, and approach things differently. We can feel better about ourselves and feel better about the challenge. We'll be more positively emotional about ourselves and we'll behave differently. And that's the way we, changing the way we think will unlock whole new potential. So just finishing off here, I'm, I'm, I'm putting forward that mobile knowledge mentoring eradicates time, distance, location, the challenges with managing logistics and expert dependencies. And it solves many of the new world of work challenges, critical uh, connectedness, uh, sense making, a sense of belonging, psychosocial support. And so what it does is it connects us to the collaborative pulse, uh, what we call connected responsiveness. So the group can respond. Collective reasoning for challenges that no one has ever come across. Sharing knowledge that, that we get by ourselves and we can add value to the community. We can build inclusive societies. And most importantly, with using the analytics of the data that's produced in this mobile knowledge sharing with these large groups is we can ensure measured impact. And I'm sorry that was a bit rushed at the end and I'd like to thank you and take any questions. Thank, thank you, Philip. There we go. A little bit of a video hiccup there. Um, if you, Philip, if you uh, want to alt tab over to back to the, the Zoom, you'll see uh, the, the chat sort of toolbox there. Um, so away from your slideshow, but over, over to the Zoom, you should then see your options again. Yeah. And then if you um, click on the chat button, you'll see uh, there have been a couple of recent chats. If you'd like to address those. Thank you, sir. Stop sharing. Okay, sorry. Okay, there I am. Uh, my chat. There's chat. Okay, I like the. I really like that, Steve. I like that. Maybe can you someone point me at a question with respect to the holarchic model? I believe the what's in it for me concept is becoming anachronistic and needs to be replaced by education in grade school. Yeah, I agree absolutely. Um, 
I, I agree with that. Yeah, I don't really have a comment on that. I think I think the whole schooling system needs to be turfed out and changed completely. Um, got it. The utilities with common problems are not a competitive market. Yeah. Okay. So that was David's question. Um, government offers decline financial poverty. Is there definition for digital poverty? I, not 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 one that I have. So Steve, um, I think I think my understanding for digital poverty would be the the people that have not grown up in, in, in a digital world or have not been given the ability to from a digital transformation. I think digital poverty is nothing to do with financial poverty. I think um, I know people, Eric and Brandon, we, we know people um, that that don't have smartphones and um, and are, are very successful, very experienced business people, are CEOs of, of, in, of organizations. Um, uh, so, so I think digital poverty is going to increasingly be a problem, but it's not anything to do with financial poverty. I hope that answers that question. Will you share your presentation? Yeah, I, I, I'll share the I'll share a PDF with with with, with you later. Um, I just need to put it into PDF format. I just we have an issue with our material very often get getting reused. We'll do that. Is there a competitive element between energy companies? Is there a philosophical point? On it? I'm not picking up a question that I need to answer. Um, is there, it is a philosophical, okay, so there's a, Steve agrees it's philosophical. Eric, can you point me or can anybody point me? Are there any demographics that are more agile or fragile in these changes? Um, okay, so that's Mueller Gage. I recognize that name for some reason. Um, Mueller, I think the, ac across the world, the, when I presented, when and when I do present continuously, I, what I am picking up is that, is that in developing societies, uh, the de demographics in developing societies very often have a large proportion of people that are, uh, you know, we, we might call them from a digital poverty point of view, but they have significantly disadvantaged educational uh, journeys um, and and their access to learning and their access to quality jobs and mentorship and experience of, of real work are, are very, very real. I, I think the, the, I, I don't have research to, to be able to quote, but if you look at the Nesta documentation that I shared with you, and that is available out there, they have quite significant, they've, they've essentially um, mapped the UK, Italy and France, and there are demographic splits over there, but I don't have them uh, necessarily for, for Africa. I know that my experience in Africa is that there, there's, there's a lot of work to be done in redressing traditional schooling systems with public schooling, with government schooling, with the, the more elite universities, with the, the more emergent universities. So those are big things that are all to do with the world of transformation in developing societies. Um, so that is real, but from a, from a, I don't have a, a more elaborate or elegant answer for you. Thank you. There's a very there's a very interesting question. I'd love to have a look at that. Steve's asked a really good thing. Is it premature to define major ages? Okay, so we've kind of talked about that. Steve, I don't have a, a very quick good answer for that, and I'd I'd like to read that and try and make sense of it. But I, you're probably very right. I think the age of um, the age of change is going to be is going to accelerate. It's going to become shorter and shorter for sure, for sure. Eric, I think I'm not sure about everyone's timing. Is, do you want to continue? I think that's it. Unless anyone else has any other questions, they'd like to offer Philip here in the remaining seconds that we have. If you do, uh, please uh, use the chat box right away. Otherwise, I think that might be it. Um, to to everyone out there, thank you for joining us. Uh, we did record this, so we'll make the recording available uh, as well as uh, the slides. We'll have to uh, figure out the best way to um, to deliver the slides in a way that's, uh, that Philip is, is comfortable with. Um, but i um, glad to get this added to our library, so to speak. Uh, Philip, are you available offline for any questions as well? We can make sure that- Yeah, I'm, I'm in no rush. So, so, so if anybody wants to stay, I'm, I'm happy to stay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for hosting today, Philip. It was very informative. And this is just uh, the first of a series of webinars that we do plan to do with Philip. Uh, we'll be announcing those topics and dates uh, in the coming days and weeks. Um, hope to get another one in soon with you, Philip. So uh, thanks so much for, for hosting. It's a pleasure, Brandon. Eric Lurie, thank you from KMI USA. Very nice, nice to be collaborating with you at last all, after all these years. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, to the, thank you to the audience, uh, whoever's still left. Uh, thank you for participating. I appreciate it.